This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources, an energy company dedicated to respecting the land. Alpha Natural Resources, we power the world through the energy of our people. Haley Buick GMC, the place for a new Verano or Terrain Denali. In Richmond and online at HaleyBuickGMC.com. Everywhere there are lighting poles, there's one more opportunity to save money. Intelligent Illuminations provides cost-effective wireless lighting solutions for roadway or area outdoor lights. Kanawha Valley Arena, Virginia's cowboy town, hosting an array of events from Civil War reenactments to diesel truck pulls. More information online at virginiarodeo.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. So what do you do? Information about getting involved in advanced technology careers, making everything from clean energy to life-saving medicine, is available at dreamitdoitvirginia.com. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond, and a very special welcome to two members of the Governor's Cabinet. Appreciate your being here, Brian Moran, Secretary of Public Safety, but it's now also Public Safety and Homeland Security, yes, it right? Is. And John Newby, the, the Deputy Secretary in Veterans and Affairs and uh, That's correct. Veterans, and Veterans and Defense, defense Affairs. Affairs. Yes, right. I had to get that down because uh, tell the viewers the reason I'm stumbling over this is that the the secretariats have changed somewhat. It was public safety, the past administration, and it was Veterans and Homeland Security. Yeah, so that's been been changed. So we, we might even start the program to get the two of you to explain to the the viewers. Why the change, why the importance of the change, and the value of the change? Well, uh, I congratulate the legislature for recognizing this and passing legislation with the support of the governor to change uh, not only the name, but the right. function. Uh, the Secretary of Public Safety has 11 agencies under uh, the umbrella of the public safety. Uh, several of those agencies are directly responsible to prepare and respond to a disaster, whether man-made or terrorist attack. And so uh, last year, uh, JLARC, a very respected um, a group, did a study to determine uh, the best coordination in how to better align the agencies with their secretariat, because previously we had a secretary of public safety and a secretary of homeland security. Uh, but the agencies directly responsible to responding to a disaster come under the Secretary of Public Safety. So uh, Jay Lark conducted a study, recommended combining the two, and the legislature followed uh, their recommendation, and, and we're very pleased now that the governor has signed the legislation in a bipartisan effort. And, uh, and essentially what your viewers need to know is we have just better aligned the responsibilities uh, to... Uh, to create better coordination, improved coordination uh, with all the agencies that are responsible. And so with that realignment, uh, yes. how's, how's your secretariat looking now about what you're... Well, I think your realignment makes perfect sense, and for our secretary in particular, what it allows us to do is, with a rename, it pretty much tells the, the audience exactly what we're doing now, concentrating on all veterans issues and all defense issues to give us more time and for, focus on veterans and to maintain or develop a greater uh, direct relationship with the Federal Department of Defense and all the activities here in, in the Commonwealth. So it's uh, really, really giving us some, some elbow room in order to move more towards the defense issues in the Commonwealth. You might tell the viewers something too about, about your boss, sure. the, the, the secretary, and about his 
uh, he's he's on the road and on some missions today, but tell, tell our viewers about him. That's right. So Admiral uh, John Harvey joined the administration at the beginning of January and uh, retired four-star four -star admiral. And uh, he's been called away for, for a little while, still with us, but uh, not physically at least. Um, he's been asked by the uh, Secretary of Defense to uh, travel the entire United States to look at our nuclear forces and some of the issues that have been experienced for the past several years um, as far as some cheating scandals and other kind of uh, nuclear handling issues. So he's been called away on a higher duty for a few weeks and um, you know, all, all good for the country and quite frankly, very good for the Commonwealth as well for had that kind of exposure and direct line of sight to uh, the Department of Defense. Uh, I will tell our viewers and tell the two of you, and I had the opportunity to meet him just a few weeks ago. I was really impressed with just how down home, easy to talk with, not someone that you uh, felt like I needed to salute before I That's had right. permission to speak, and someone quite interested in state government issues, too. Absolutely. I mean, he's a great person to work for and with, and I think um, the governor made a great pick. And welcome back to, to Richmond and from the uh, work that you've done here over the years. I was thinking, Brian, as you were talking about how the secretaries have changed, that you, you have a former colleague in the House of Delegates, Vivian Watts. When she was cabinet secretary, she had public safety and transportation. You know, just 20 some years ago, that it's interesting that, the, that those two big areas were under one secretariat. Uh, they had hard two to imagine. very large agencies yeah. and, and employees and responsibilities. So it is surprising that they were combined at one time and of course they've since been separated and certainly the Department of uh, Human Resources another one uh, Health and Human Resources under Dr. Bill Hazel is another large agency but you know, the Secretary of Public Safety has has uh, 11 departments and uh, including the National Guard, Virginia State Police, Department of Emergency Management and so uh, they're very uh, you know there's a lot of responsibility Department of Juvenile Justice, Department of Corrections enormous, you know, with 30,000 inmates here in the Commonwealth. So um, I, I'm thrilled to be in the position, very grateful to Governor McAuliffe for asking me to serve in this capacity and could not be more um, happy to be in it. Uh, certainly, it seems to make perfect sense from that study that came out of JLARC to have Homeland Security and public safety together because whether it's state police, as you named, or Department of Emergency Management or even fire programs and others that, that would be responding. Uh, that's correct, and that's what uh, Jay Lark uh, uh, studied, and I and I think many legislators suspected that, and that's why they asked for a Jay Lark study just to confirm their suspicions. That why do we have these two secretariats when when a lot of the homeland security issues have to do with those first responders, whether in um, Virginia State Police or in our fire and emergency personnel and first responders. And then, of course, the National Guard. So, indeed, that's now what we have done. We have combined those, and so there's a tremendous amount of communication now and, and coordination. VDIM, Department of Emergency Management, uh, to coordinate it. And uh, I will say, David, since I've been back in this capacity now, working with our many state agencies, how um, proud I am of our many very, very dedicated and committed state employees. Uh, certainly the ones in under the public safety umbrella and I know that for all state but those that I've been working with uh, directly um, they're very uh, they're very committed state employees and uh, you know my hats off to them particularly in those areas where where uh, public safety is a concern you know I'll tell our viewers because you and I could could speak of Jay Lark and, and John Newby also that it's the Joint Legislative Audit and Review Commission but it's j easier to say JLARC, and it's it's the one entity that the legislature has to to really do some in-depth studies. And for our viewers who are interested, they'll find JLARC meeting practically every month between now and the 2015 session, looking at at other studies that where the legislature says study this. Well, this year, David, there are a number of of issues that uh, arose during the legislative se session. Uh, some had to do with my agencies, ABC, Alcohol Beverage Control Commission, and, and there was a, a request to have them study whether or not the ABC agents should come under the auspices of the state police. They were sending it to JLARC, and, and JLARC kind of said, time out, we have so many studies requested right now, it would be 
couple of years, if not several years down the road. So I, I think that's a reflection of the great work that they do, that they're so well respected that the legislature asked them to do uh, so many studies. And uh, not like in the federal government, you have the Office of Management Budget, you have uh, Congressional uh, Budget Office, you have even Congressional Research Service. So there's a number of entities that do independent studies um, really here where we have uh, JLARC and they do a great job but uh, they're, uh, they're asked to do a great deal. Now over in your secretariat yes. that, that you're working in, um, tell our viewers something about what the Veterans Affairs part. What? Sure. Well one a big uh, objective of the governor of course economic development and part of that is jobs. Uh, so a big thing that we're concentrating on in the, over the next four years is just that for veterans' jobs, which has always been the case. Uh, but we like to try to change or expand the focus of, of that endeavor. Our Department of Veterans Services has always provided job training and preparing our veterans to leave the uniform and join the civilian workforce. Uh, we also have, on the flip side, um, a program called uh, Virginia Values Veterans. And what this does is take the other part of the equation, which is the employers, convince employers or train employers why uh, hiring veterans makes business sense, why a veteran coming in the door has certain, uh, possess certain skills and ability to step into the job and do it from day one without any problems, any hassles, know how to show up on time, uh, very dependable, has leadership skills. So under our Virginia Values Veterans Program, we try to complete the circle of the economic development jobs piece um, not just training the veteran, but training the employer as well uh, to make sure that we can help our veterans uh, become gainfully employed in the Commonwealth and keep them here with those skills that they have. You know, it was recently reported that Virginia's unemployment rate had dropped below 5%. Right. Hadn't been there in a while. I haven't seen the numbers on veterans, but, but whenever those numbers surface, it seems like we even have a, whether it's in Virginia or even nationwide, a higher percentage of veterans unemployed than in population as, as a whole. David, that's always the case, and I haven't seen the most recent numbers, but uh, routinely uh, when the nationwide average drops, the veterans' unemployment tends to stay a couple points above that. And that's part of our desire in my secretariat and for the governor to bridge that gap, to help veterans and help employers understand those skills that veterans have, uh, to allow them to go straight into those jobs that, that are out there and available, but the employees don't, the employers don't understand the real asset that they're getting from veterans. So once we convince the employers of what they're getting, which most employers understand and appreciate, uh, but to disseminate that knowledge a little bit more, we can hopefully increase the number of uh, vets who are hired and, and accordingly decrease that unemployment percentage. Because it, it certainly looks like that employers would see someone who's been honorably discharged and has been in the military, whether it's one term or a longer term would be someone who really knows how to be a part of a team. I think that's right. You know, the, the problem that we see is, uh, myself being a veteran, I saw this as well when I came out, is sometimes those skills that veterans have aren't directly translatable over to what the civilian employer wants. Although that veteran probably has all the basic skills and probably some of the technical capabilities, getting a piece of paper from the veteran to translate that is, is a bit of a challenge. So that's part of the process that we go through with veterans in our Department of Veteran Services is helping the veteran understand how to translate those valuable skills over to something that um, you know the private industry can appreciate. Um, you know, A lot of skills such as cyber and computer uh, based skills are probably easily translatable, not so much for some of the more classified endeavors that uh, veterans have or some of the basic skills that some, some veterans also possess. So the key is that translation piece and to help a veteran understand how to translate help the uh, employer understand what it really means and connect the two and uh, drive those numbers in the positive direction. You know, one of the big employers, I think, in, in this region, or um, not so much employers, but it fits, I'm not sure which secretary it is. I'll, I'll find out right now. Sure. National Guard. Which, which secretary? It's uh, Military Affairs and Public Safety. That's right. Okay. Because it, it, it I was, as I was Phrasing the question, I was thinking that, uh, I mean, that's a large installation just south of Richmond and some headquartered in the Richmond area that, that it's... Uh, they, uh, you know, we, they've uh, been terrific. Uh, we have called on the Guard now twice 
since uh, Governor McAuliffe has taken office because of the snowstorms. Mm -hmm. We've declared two national uh, two uh, state of emergencies, and we've called on the guard. I think the first time was up to uh, two, 300 national guardsmen asked to be mobilized and activated, and and then the last storm was the 100. I, I visited. I had the chance to go to two of the armories in this area and visited with them. Uh, they were prepared with their chainsaws, ready to go out and clear debris, and so they're terrific partners with the state, and uh, we will be working uh, hand in glove. Uh, with uh, the uh, in anticipation of the cuts, uh, there will be a battle between active military and the National Guard. I know General Long uh, has a good relationship with uh, General Grass at the national level, and uh, and Admiral Harvey a good relationship with the uh, mm -hmm. uh, Secretary of Defense. So you know Virginia does have a, a large guard presence. Uh, we have a great relationship. They're great partners. And we need to make sure that uh, whatever cuts do occur, they do not reduce uh, the capability and the capacity of our state uh, National Guard so that they can be uh, partners with us and respond to any disasters. And on, and on the other side, I guess the, the working to, to try to minimize the impact on Virginia. That's correct. Uh, so, you know, this is a fairly unique situation. You know, the Guard falls under um, Secretary Moran's. Uh, Secretariat, but of course we uh, on our side and Veterans of Defense um, take a look at all of our military assets, including the Guard, to help protect them and making sure that uh, those assets are protected for the Commonwealth and indeed the nation. You know, as the Secretary said, you know, we're looking at potentially, well not potentially, definitely at least a minimum cut from 355,000 nationwide Guard forces to down to 335,000 for sure and potentially down to 315,000 if sequestration holds through 2016. So part of my secretary's job is to convince uh, the Department of Defense and others in the federal government that, hey, you know, Virginia has lots of military assets, lots of guard assets. You know, we're looking out for all of them, including the guard, uh, but in particular the guard because they are ours. And we need to do everything we can do to, to keep them here and because they provide not just a um, service for us in the Commonwealth, but for indeed the nation when they deploy. Does our proximity to the, to the nation's capital help, in a sense, uh, bolster the argument that we need to, to keep our numbers up? I think it does. I mean, obviously, you know, from a practical perspective, uh, myself or Secretary Harvey or Secretary Moran get in the car and go, go direct up to D.C. to talk to the congressional delegation, they're ready access to help us voice those concerns. But also just the huge presence of, of the military and, and the federal government in general in the state of Virginia, uh, you know, helps the argument. I mean, we, we're currently, as far as um, defense spending dollars, we're currently first in the nation for those dollars. Um, and we, of course, we have a huge, you know, presence defense-wise in the Commonwealth that needs protecting. And uh, when we have those assets right here in Virginia, it makes it easy to point to those and say, hey, look, here's what, we, here's what you have in Virginia right next door. Um, let's keep them here and here are the good reasons why. So I think geographic uh, concerns are you know, way in our favor for sure. We're going to be working very closely together, David, and of course Virginia was the subject of the 9-11 attacks at the Pentagon. Right. Uh, and in the Homeland Security area, we do receive uh, a lot of federal money uh, for grants so that we are indeed um, capable of preventing against and preparing for uh, such attacks. I will say the good news is uh, the Department of Homeland Security did provide a 15 percent increase in Homeland Security grants for the Commonwealth of Virginia, a 15 percent increase. And in the Hampton Roads area, uh, they were provided $1 million in grants uh, and they were recognized as a high threat area. Uh, you know, the good news and the bad news, of course, is they're a high threat area, but they are good news is they'll, they're receiving a million dollars in grants to prepare against any attacks. Um, that had not been done since 2011, so this year it was uh, a lot of hard work uh, on the behalf of a lot of people. Uh, but now they have some resources to prepare because, as um, uh, Secretary Newby was saying, uh, we, we have uh, a number of assets here in the Commonwealth, military installations uh, and other uh, infrastructure assets that, you know, frankly are, are, are targets. And so we need to do whatever is necessary to prepare and prevent uh, such attacks. You know, back not too many years ago when you served and served in leadership in the House of Delegates, there was concern that among the public safety entities, 
they had trouble even communicating with each other at, at times when there was a literally yeah because oh, of their, oh, their, their, phone <laughs> their radios yeah right, their radios right. and, and right and it wasn't for a lack of effort, a willingness to no, communicate no, with each no, other. No, right? it was not. No, we don't that, want to talk. Well, that it was continues just... to be an issue with technology, David, uh, and we, we're certainly aware of it. And everyone wants to come together, and we're working on inter interoperability uh, between the state police, uh, local emergency personnel, fire uh, personnel, uh, National Guard, uh, uh, all need to be on a similar frequency so they can indeed uh, communicate with each other in 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 a time of emergency. Yeah. So that's still a work in progress. It is yes. indeed, yes. but we're, yeah. a lot of progress has been made, yeah. and we continue yeah. to do yeah. that. Yes. Uh, cer certainly, I, I haven't heard as much of, about the problem as it was some time right. ago. So hopefully, that means it is it is getting better. Right. It is getting better. So on the with veterans. Or with others, is is this health care debate spilling in any way into your two secretariats? I know uh, from your top boss, the governor, that the closing the gap in the health care is, is really essential. Does it relate it in any way to, to veterans or to? Well, I'll speak to the veteran side. I definitely think it does. I mean, veterans are, uh, you know, members of this community, members of the Commonwealth. We represent. Um, I say we, myself, being a veteran. You know, one out, of our, one out of every 10 uh, Virginians that are walking down the street that you bump, to, bump into is a veteran, over 800,000 people. Um, so in that group is a subset of folks as the general population who are not covered. Uh, lots of individuals think that uh, because you're a veteran that you're, you're right. covered. Right. Uh, well, there are only certain subsets of veterans who have that coverage, veterans who have made it to 20 years to retirement veterans who have been uh, wounded or otherwise affected by their military service who have VA benefits. Uh, but there's a, a group in between, a gap, if you will, of veterans who don't have those services and fall squarely within the gap. Um, so about 25,000 veterans and spouses uh, will be positively affected by closing the coverage gap. And we're talking veterans who are by themselves squarely fit within the, the um, parameters for expanded Medicaid as well as their, their family members, and also veterans who still have VA benefits but can supplement those benefits. So yes, for sure, veterans can definitely benefit from an expansion. Well, unlike veterans, uh, certainly the public safety system, uh, court system, would be benefited by expanding uh, Medicaid. Uh, our jails and sheriffs have done a local study. Uh, close to half of those who are incarcerated in our local jails suffer from some mental illness. Uh, closing the coverage gap would mean more services and access to mental health services for those inmates. Uh, it, it, it would, our jail should not be uh, some of the largest mental health facilities here in the Commonwealth. Uh, those um, uh, defendants uh, uh, should be receiving the appropriate mental health treatment and um, prescriptions necessary to treat their illness. They are not being properly treated in our jails despite what uh, you know, our jail attempting to do, it, they would benefit substantially from appropriate mental health services, and it would reduce uh, our crime rate and our recidivism rate. So yes, it, it's very applicable in that scenario to uh, improving the public safety of the Commonwealth. And if I understood Secretary Hazel, and he was on the show earlier, even ones who are in prisons, the Department of Corrections that uh, currently where the state, I think, is out for the, the expense, for any medical expense, is that? The Department of Corrections would, would uh, experience a, a, a substantial savings as well because uh, those inmates are not currently eligible but would be eligible uh, under the expansion. Uh, when they receive medical services at a hospital, that would be covered by Medicaid, 100%. Uh, so now it's being paid by Virginia taxpayers, and so um, again, uh, a substantial savings to the Commonwealth of Virginia. Really appreciate the two of you being on this week in Richmond, and the, the time just flies by. <laughs> we want to make sure that if it hasn't been seen already, that your websites are up, so they can get more information. About well, we have Facebook as well, Public Safety Virginia. We have ah. Facebook. There's so much going on in the public safety area and veterans areas. We try to recognize our. 
uh, courageous men and, men and women in uniform throughout the Virginia. So we, we update our Facebook page constantly, so I'd encourage your viewers to take a look at our Facebook page through social media, Public Safety Virginia, and we really want to bring good attention and recognition to those uh, law enforcement officers here in the Commonwealth. Well, thank you both very much for being on this week in thank Richmond, you. and let the Admiral know we'll have him at a later time. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources, an energy company dedicated to respecting the land. Alpha Natural Resources, we power the world through the energy of our people. Haley Buick GMC, the place for a new Verano or Terrain Denali. In Richmond and online at HaleyBuickGMC.com. Everywhere there are lighting poles, there's one more opportunity to save money. Intelligent Illuminations provides cost-effective wireless lighting solutions for roadway or area outdoor lights. Kanawha Valley Arena, Virginia's cowboy town, hosting an array of events from Civil War reenactments to diesel truck pulls. More information online at VirginiaRodeo.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. So what do you do? Information about getting involved in advanced technology careers, making everything from clean energy to life-saving medicine, is available at dreamitdoitvirginia.com. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.